attorney's job is to provide uh, le uh, legal leadership in the law enforcement area and also to reflect the values of the community in terms of how we enforce uh, the criminal laws in Colorado. Um, and we uh, receive cases uh, usually having been investigated by one of the nine different police departments in my district or the state patrol or the federal agencies that send us cases and our job is to review those cases review the evidence in those cases and then make decisions about filing charges under pretty clear ethical and other protocols and some protocols I've established in the office for what our priorities are now building trust is an essential uh, uh, role for everybody in law enforcement, but especially for the district attorney. The system can't work if the public doesn't have confidence in the system. The issue of, um, there's been a fair amount of discussion recently about the issue of when and in what <coughs> manner uh, criminal charges should be brought uh, against police officers. We um, have, I think, a very strong and healthy working relationship with all the police agencies in Boulder County. However, in my uh, time as district attorney, we have not hesitated uh, to file criminal charges against police officers if we felt it was appropriate. The key issue for us is whether the evidence uh, supports criminal charges <coughs> and whether the law of Colorado as applied to the situation uh, would support criminal charges. In my time as district attorney, we prosecuted 17 different police officers from the various uh, agencies here, including one case that was followed fairly closely that involved the death of an elk. Um, uh, now, a lot of times people ask questions about <coughs> why do you not, it, and then our job is also to provide uh, public analysis of the use of force by police officers, and if we choose not to file criminal charges, we have a process by which I issue a public letter explaining uh, the decision we made with regard to that and why we, and, and why we made the decision uh, with regard to that. Since I've been here, there have been nine incidents in my six plus years as district attorney in which I've issued those letters. One of them involved um, a University of Colorado student whose criminal case went to trial yesterday and he was found guilty of four counts of menacing uh, police officers, which I think was a, <clears throat> a reflection of the community voice on that case. Finally, let me say this. Uh, we have a real commitment in my office to take as many cases as we can to jury trial. The reason that I'm a strong believer in jury trial is it's a terrific voice for the community. It's a terrific opportunity for the community to hear all the evidence, to hear the law of Colorado as it applies to the case, and then the jury has the opportunity to return a verdict that they think is fair and appropriate. It's also public, there's no behind the scenes, uh, negotiation, it's all played out in public. So I want us to take as many cases as we can uh, to jury trial, and we've done that in, in a number of the cases that have involved police officers, and I think it's important for the public to see it. One final point I would make, uh, a lot of people don't fully appreciate in, in looking at this issue that the law of Colorado, as it's been adopted by the legislature, which Raleigh and uh, Jonathan are members of, have a number of protections for police officers for the use of force that do not apply to other people. And, and so therefore, if a police officer uses force uh, in, involving a weapon or otherwise in the course of his or her duties, we have to analyze the evidence and then we have to analyze the law of Colorado as it applies uh, to that situation. A lot of times people kind of casually discuss these issues with <coughs> a sense of, well, why aren't you filing more cases against police officers using force. One of the reasons is because the legislature, I think wisely, has created lots of protections for police officers so that they're able to do what they need to do to maintain public order and public safety. So that's uh, my office. I'm always happy, even though as Jonathan said, I need to leave around three. I'm always happy to talk to any of you. A number of you have been to my office, and I'm always happy to talk and have further conversation, and I look forward to this discussion today. Thank you. So, um, so, so next, next up on our list, and just for the members of our audience that, that have joined us, we're going to have our, our presenters come and present for, for about five minutes each, and then uh, hopefully we can have a, have a conversation and discussion with, with everybody here at the table. So, so next up is, I don't know if Ian and Marta would like to, to join us um, up here, or maybe, all right, just you can carry the load for both. 
And you know, the reason I'm, I'm happy to have uh, El Comic Day represented here, and it's great to see one of the other founders, Dan Benavides, here, is because <coughs> really when I heard about Ferguson, the first thing I thought about was Longmont 30 years ago, and how Longmont could have become another Ferguson. And thanks to El Comite and its citizens and, and its leaders, you know, we aren't on the front page like Ferguson ended up, but uh, I'm sure you've got more to share. So my name is Ian McKinley. I, again, for those of you just about a uh, private immigration and criminal defense attorney in Longmont, and I'm also on the board of directors of El Comité, which is a grassroots nonprofit organization that was formed in 1980 after um, a police shooting similar to the one like in Ferguson, where a, a young Latino man was shot by policemen, arguably two of them. Two of them. Mm -hmm. I apologize. And so. Um, from what, you know, again, Martha's been there from the beginning. Um, I'm new to El Comité. From my understanding is there's a bunch of outside groups wanting to come in and uh, wreak havoc in Longmont, do riots, etc. What El Comité did was say, no, we don't want that in our community. What we want to do is try to work this out, improve relations, improve the situation in Longmont. So El Comité, the committee, worked with the police department, and they really were able to um, do some, some, some healing in Longmont and in the Department of Justice. In the Department of Justice, yeah. And so Martin can talk about more of that uh, or what it is. But that's where sort of kept El Comité did its premise from a situation that could have been explosive and they were able to contain it, work together, and um, you know, really do some good for the community. And uh, about ninety-five percent of my clients are undocumented immigrants from either Mexico or Central America the vast majority of which don't speak a lick of English. So I definitely see how community involvement from the police or lack thereof can make a huge, huge difference, especially in that demographic of the, um, of the population, which there's a lot of them in, in, in Boulder County. And the vast majority of them, I can say from personal experience, are people that I think most of us would not have an objection living here, living among us. Um, a lot of them just work hard, try to help their families, you know, reach a better lifestyle, um, and so, and I see a lot of times how, I'll say in Boulder County, uh, I think we're pretty blessed to have Mr. Garnett as a district attorney because a lot of situations where an undocumented immigrant gets in trouble, um, you know, the, the punishment can be very disproportionate given what the immigration consequences can be afterward. And you look at, if you go up to like Weld County or Larimer County or some more conservative counties, um, you know, the treatment, for that demographic is not as just as you might, as it is in um, in Boulder County, and I see a lot of times where, for example, you see a spouse or someone who's a citizen who speaks English and an undocumented spouse who doesn't speak a lick of English. And a lot of times, it's the person who doesn't speak English um, that ends up getting arrested, etc. And so I just see. Uh, Witness firsthand, firsthand how when the community really does, or when the police do make that effort to engage with the community, um, especially that demographic, that it, that it really causes them to be able to come forward and have more trust in the police, um, in, the, in, in the authorities in the community. And so um, I'm sure Mark can talk about it more, but we definitely appreciate the efforts that police are willing to make to reach out and engage. Um, in addition, I'd like to add to yeah. that we work with a diverse population. I always say we work with the young, the old, the restless, the in-between, and even the dead. Yeah, because we have a like, diverse population, people from Mexico, Hondureños, Salvadoreños, Guatemaltecos, from Mexico, even from state to state. A lot of times they're victims of a system that they don't know, they don't understand, because language is a barrier. So people come from here, they get into an accident, work related, that, whatever. Those individuals that are not from here want to go back home, wherever home is. So we work with our communities, our churches, and our funeral homes to have a decent go back home with their families. And then and the system, you know, is, is, is hard for them to understand. So we are the voice, the negotiating body between the Hispanic or non-Hispanic, Boulder County and the surrounding areas. Word of mouth and <coughs> goes all over. So people have moved out of state or whatever, and they also continue to contact in us and a lot of times they say, is there a community here or there? Well, they wish they were, but we'd like to be that voice and connect them to the uh, right direction. So this is something good that's happening so that we can all understand and trust and build that 
faith and understanding with our law enforcement and the community so we can understand and uh, help the community to understand what is happening, who's fault, who's not, and uh, those things that are very important in our community, regardless of race or, or whatever language you speak or don't speak. So our office is in, in, in Long Run. We work really great with our, our uh, Stanger Net, which is when you have that trust with your DA, whatever, you know, and help people to understand and have that trust because we say the law enforcement is out there to do law enforcement. We're here to do the social justice. We call it as the, the dog that barks. When smell is going to bark, if need be, for having that understanding both ways. Thank you, Marta. And uh, looks like Representative Mike Foote has joined us. Dan, I don't know if you had anything to add about El Comité's journey for the last 35 well, years. You know, I haven't really been associated with it, but along with Marta was saying, maybe she put me to literally within the last almost a year, we've been walking in all of the neighborhoods, predominantly Latino neighborhoods in the city of Long Island. And uh, we talked to hundreds of people. And the idea being belonging. And the idea being, here's the chief, public safety of Long Island, walking right down in the neighborhoods. And I asked, as his interpreter, and opening up the doors, I also met with Chief Testa and Sergeant Dowd the other day when we walked in our neighborhoods here in Boulder. <coughs> and what we're getting back, and what you can talk to when it comes to your time, but it's beautiful, because that is the way that when you feel you belong to a community, when you belong, and here you are with hierarchy, <coughs> right down in the neighborhoods, and walking, spending your Sunday afternoons talking with people. And that's what you what we've been doing. And it was just last summer, before Ferguson, and what we've been getting back from all over the country, by the way, is that if people were doing what Longmont was doing, Chief Butler's doing, there wouldn't be any Ferguson's. So anyway, I'll just add that. Well, that was a perfect and segue because we're, we're going to hear from, from Chief Butler next. So, um, and you know, I compliment Marta. And of course, we've been together for years. I was one of the founders of Marta. Those were tough times. Well, good afternoon. I'm Mike Butler. I'm the Public Safety Chief in Longmont. Um, thank you, Representative Singer, for having us all here. Uh, one thing, I, a couple things I want to say on the front end. Um, I don't like the phrase law enforcement. Uh, we're, it, we do so much more than that. In fact, only 20% of the calls we go on have a crime attached to 80% of the calls don't. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't go to those calls because some of those calls are like suspicious calls and things like that, but the vast majority of what we do has nothing to do with enforcing the law. So I'm not a fan of the word law enforcement. I understand as a title of this, but we do a, so much more in our community. And, and so for me, trust in, in policing, I think it has to go a lot deeper than perhaps, where, where, perhaps what, what was intended here today. Uh, I believe police departments have way too much power in our communities. And, and the reason why I believe that is because I think our communities have abdicated that power and, and have said to the police, we want you to take care of our business. And, and, and I'm not saying that the police weren't responsible for that at some level too, because for decades what police uh, departments would say to communities is if you need us, call us for anything. Well, communities took us up on that. And, and so what we have is we have this relationship that, in my mind, is a dependent relationship. It's an unhealthy dependency, in my mind, in terms of between our communities and, and between our police departments. I don't think that equilibrium is there to really build the kind of trust that I think we're really trying to build. And, and so and we, say, we like to say in Longmont that we want to work in partnership with our community. And we want our community to take joint accountability. But I will say, and one of the attributes of partnership for me is the right to say no. But I know that when I talk to all of our police chiefs, and I just actually had a long conversation, I spoke to about 70 police chiefs here uh, Thursday um, around all of this. And, um, and all of them will tell you that it's hard for a police department to go into a community and say no. 
And it's hard for us to expect, at some level, that joint accountability. Now, that right to say no and joint accountability are, are clear attributes of partnership. But we don't have that, necessarily. There's this incredible expectation on the part of police, and I will also say our criminal justice system. And I think a lot of weight has gone into uh, trying to fix our social issues through the criminal justice system. Uh, that's my way of seeing it. We have issues, we deal a lot with people who struggle with mental, Ill, a mental illness, we deal a lot with people who struggle with addiction, we deal a lot with people who don't have permanent homes or homeless, we deal a lot with people who have, uh, are suffering with poverty in Longmont, around 20% of the kids in Longmont are under the poverty line. And so those are social issues that ultimately end up mostly on the backs of police and the criminal justice system. And it's not to say that there aren't other agencies and other resources mm -hmm. out there trying to help with these issues, but ultimately there's just a lot that ends up coming our way. And so what we end up doing, quite a bit of, is when we find these social issues, we end up trying to pass laws to try to fix these social issues. That's my take on it. And, and so we pass a law, uh, we, we, we invoke our criminal justice system, police departments either have to arrest or summons, and, and, and therefore it looks like the police and criminal justice system are gonna take care of these social issues. That, in, in my mind, that is the depth we need to go to in these kinds of conversations. It's not on the surface where I think most of these conversations can take place and do take place. It's the depth of who's responsible for what. Is government and police responsible for all these things? 80% of the calls we go on don't have a crime attached to them. Or is it, should our community take more responsibility? And so I'm a fan of our communities taking more responsibility. And I, and I think we have to figure something out. Uh, we have to have a new dynamic and a new kind of conversation in our communities that, that lend, itself, lend themselves to bringing that equilibrium to life. And so one of the things we've done in Longmont is we're very active in the process called restorative justice. That is a community-based system run by the community. Literally thousands of people in Longmont have been involved in actually, in actually uh, with that process. And I don't know how, I'm not gonna go into the process itself, the specifics, but this is a process that bypasses, for the most part, the criminal justice system in Longmont. And so instead of arresting somebody, or instead of summonsing somebody, we send those folks to our restorative justice process. Now, over the years, uh, Longmont has sent close to somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 cases to uh, the restorative justice process. That's in lieu of our criminal justice process. And we send people who have, who have been, they, they were involved in felonies. Um, we send multiple offenders. Um, we send adults, we send kids. And I will tell you, the recidivism rate coming out of that is approximately 10%. And the recidivism rate coming out of the criminal justice system is considerably higher. Any, it's anybody's guess, but it's somewhere between 50 and 70%. I think it depends the county you're in, uh, the state you're in, so that's a process we've been using that I think, we only have like 100,000 people in our community. And when you start doing the math in terms of the number of people that we have spent, uh, sent to our restorative justice process, and you look at recidivism rates, you can start to see, well, the crime is probably gonna go down. Because here's what happens. And we did a study a few years ago in which we looked at 235 people we arrested for felonies, three different felonies, burglaries, Car, house break-ins, car break-ins, and vandalism. And when we went back and looked at their histories on each and every one of those 235 people who went through the criminal justice system, what we found is that on average, each of those 235 people before that arrest had been arrested nine times. On average, each of those people had been arrested or had been charged 27 times. And so, not to say that there is room and a place for the criminal justice system. I'm not, I'm not minimizing the, the importance of the system. My point is, is that I think we've overburdened that system. And I think that overburdening has come from the way we think and how we do business in our society, and what we do in terms of trying to find and fix social issues. So that's my take on that, and I can go on and on and on and on about it. 
But it's one of those things that I think is important, and I, again, I think that's the depth of discussion we need to have. Another thing that Dan talked about was uh, our walking in our communities, our walking in our neighborhoods. Excuse me, I got a cold here. So, Dan and I, I asked Dan last July if he would join me. And, and Dan and I have walked probably 16 or 17 neighborhoods. We try to do it with good weather. And we go out, and we go out in the, and the reason why we do it with good weather is because people are outside. And so we, we meet and greet a lot of people. And we've met hundreds and hundreds of people. We've only dealt, we've only walked in neighborhoods that have been, excuse me, economically poor and predominantly Spanish speaking. And so, and a lot of those folks are undocumented. A lot of those folks, um, yeah, just speak Spanish. And so, um, what we have found, um, well, we ask questions like, do you feel like you belong um, in our community? Do you feel welcome? Do you feel invited? Do you feel like your community and neighborhood is safe? What have been your contacts like with the police? How have those gone? And so we ask a series of questions. We also occasionally offer people opportunities to get involved in something else in our community. And so the idea is trying to figure out um, how, what, what level of belonging do be, people have in our community. And for me, I'm going to stop here in a minute, but for me, the, the idea of belonging has two levels. The first is relational. I belong to this community. Do people really feel like they belong to this community? And number two, this community belongs to me. It's ownership. And so what kind of investment am I willing to make in this community. And so those two aspects of belonging are what we're trying to figure out where people are at in terms of how they feel about their community and what kind of investment they're willing to make in our community. And by the way, our police officers, and since I oversee fire, our firefighters are gonna start walking neighborhoods, parks, and business districts as well. Because the power of connection and the power of relationship in my mind is another piece of the conversation that we need to have in terms of how we build that trust. And so we can go into a neighborhood, respond to a call for service, and leave the neighborhood. And frankly, that's, a lot of, that's what a lot of people see. But we have to get out of our cars, and we have to start walking these neighborhoods, and we have to start making relationships and connections very, very important. And so that's about all my cold is going to let me say. So <laughs> happy to answer questions, but thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, do you want to add anything from a student perspective? Uh, I will preface this by saying that um, I was kind of chosen by lack of anybody else um, <laughs> showing up today. But I think I think some of the concerns of the students um, are maybe self-explanatory um, interactions with interactions with uh, police at parties, um, uh, unfortunately interactions with CU and maybe to a lesser extent Boulder police when sexual assaults happen. Um, I think these are the major issues that the students are kind of concerned about. Um, and I'll, I'll try to answer questions or give, give feedback as I can about, about that. And, and it looks like uh, actually um, uh, Detective Schultz uh, had a family conflict and he just notified me he couldn't make it. And so uh, I, I don't know, Deputy Johnson, if you feel like pinch hitting a little bit, well, talking about the Boulder. Experience. I can talk a little bit about that. I guess I think from the prepared remarks, um, <laughs> Chief Test is out of town today, so I got drafted to fill in for him. But uh, I think for us and why I'm here, the most important reason is to listen. Um, one of the things that I think we need to do a better job at is listening to our community. And we've been working really hard. We uh, set out some master planning years ago. and. One of those master planning goals was to look at what we do as an organization in regards to community policing in Boulder. And then over the last year, we've had a tremendous amount of change in our organization at the administrative level. Um, in the last year, we've got a new chief, two new deputy chiefs, and five new commanders. And that change is really something we're trying to seize as opportunity for our organization. Um, because it gives us some fresh blood, some fresh perspective, and some fresh ideas on how we can re-engage in our community, what we can do to build trust. Um, as Stan mentioned, there have been no shortage of uh, high-profile cases, sometimes involving the Boulder Police Department, and we know that that has, in some ways, diminished our trust in the community, what people think of us. 
and we want to work hard to fix that. And uh, so throughout the spring, one of our goals is to meet with more community groups, be more engaged in the community, and find out what community expectations are for us so that we can do a better job of working with them to deal with the problems in our community. So this is really an opportune time for us to listen, to learn. Uh, there are things that Mogwent PD does well. Mike may not remember this, but he hired me as a police officer so, some <laughs> 22 years ago or so when he worked at Boulder. Um, and so there are lots of opportunities for us to learn and get information from people that will help us develop as a fairly new organization at the top of our organization. And uh, so really, I, I think that's what I have to say, Jonathan, is um, I'm really open to your comments and your feedback because we want to learn and grow and make sure that we are meeting the needs of our community and doing what we can. Uh, I certainly do not disagree with Chief Butler that uh, a very small part of what my police officers do every day has to do with actually enforcing the law. Uh, it's so much broader in our society right now. Uh, we have a number of different groups. You, know, you mentioned the students, and there's a balancing act for us with the student population. Um, University Hill is a unique setting where we have thousands of 18 to 22 year olds trying to live next door to people who've lived there for 30 years and just want to have a quiet place to live and balancing the community interests of both groups while trying to maintain a safe and, and realistic environment for people to interact in uh, is a challenge for us, but it's one that we're willing to take on and we want to hear feedback on. So, I look forward to your questions. And thank you for coming out for such short notice. You know, we've been, we're really fortunate to It's like a talking stick. This is yeah. a talking And many yeah. here yeah. 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 We're not trying to sugarcoat anything people are saying. But um, I'll, I'll get this started as, we, as, as we're sort of wrapping up uh, from the presentation into the, into the discussion side here. Um, I want to say we're really fortunate to have uh, a wide swath of Boulder County represented here in, in our delegation. We have State Senator Raleigh Heath who covers everywhere from, from Niwa to, to Allen's Park to Boulder, and Representative Mike Foote who covers Louisville, Lafayette, and the, the other great part of Longmont that I don't cover. So, <laughs> um, so I don't know if the two of you have, have any, any remarks that you want to add before we go into the Q&A component. No, I was just very impressed with what I just heard. So I'm yeah, very familiar with Alcante and about what you want to work you do. This is a conversation that I think is very timely. So I'm glad to be here. <coughs> Sorry, I'm running a little bit late. Um, I didn't uh, hear the first 30 minutes, but I did hear Chief Butler um, speak, and, and I agree with a lot of what he said, particularly about how the criminal justice system seems to be used for things that really it shouldn't be used for. A lot of times you have the round peg and the square hole issue because of lack of it, uh, resources that we have and that we, that we offer from the state level, particularly in the areas of mental health and human services and so forth. And um, <clears throat> I, I see it from two different perspectives as a state legislator half the year and then as a deputy DA here in Boulder the other half of the year. And um, it's really a shame to see how our uh, budgetary system actually works or doesn't work, um, and it's not just in these areas, but certainly these are the areas that are, are most relevant, I think, to this discussion. I also think, given the perspective that I have, um, it's so important for so many different reasons for the police to have the trust of the community. Um, uh, like I said, for so many different reasons, but particularly on the, what I see on the back end is there's so many cases that um, that we end up prosecuting where the police officer has to go in front of a jury of the folks here in the community. And the police officer needs to testify and, and talk about what he or she saw. And um, we hope the jury believes it. Um, there's a lot of cases that can be won or, won or lost on whether or not the jury believes them. And I think that a lot of times when we talk to juries and we talk to jurors before and talk to jurors afterwards, um, we, we see the dynamic of the trust or the lack of trust in the community play out um, on the back end. So I just think it's, it's for so many reasons that I think everyone else is discussing or will be discussing it's important. But also when it comes to trying to prove a case um, and, and actually do something about those that, that really should be in, this, in the criminal justice system or at least be a trial to be held accountable for what they did, I think it's, it's really important for that reason as well. So I, I really appreciate you all being here. and taking part in this and, and hope to hear more as well over the next hour or so. All right, well.
Thank, thank you, Representative Foot. So what I'm going to do actually is, is I've got a, a sign-up sheet here that I'm just going to, to pass around. And so if you'd like to keep in, in touch with your state lawmakers here, or more, more accurately, if you'd like them to keep in touch with you, um, go ahead and fill this out. If not, just feel free to pass it down. And I'll start one at the other end. Okay. And, um, and with that, you know, I think we, we really have two opportunities as lawmakers here today. Uh, the first one, uh, like, uh, like Deputy Johnson said, is to, to listen. And, but I think the other thing is, is we're chosen to not only represent people, we're, we're chosen to, to lead. And, and so I know the state is looking at a number of laws not as a knee-jerk reaction to things that have happened in our own community or that have happened across the nation, but uh, to build stronger relationships and stronger communities to make sure that citizens are kept safe, which is the whole reason that we, we have a, a profession out there um, with, with men and women dressed in blue. So, so with that, um, uh, I'd love to hear your questions and your ideas. I'll just kind of point, and if you want to direct your question to a particular panelist, we'll do that. Otherwise, if our panelists can respond, that that would be great too. So, any any questions or comments? All right, we'll start in the back corner. Okay, so, um, I have a bit of a rant. Um, I'm probably a little bit older than most of you here, and I grew up in the uh, war movies. And I remember, uh, the bad guys were always um, the German uh, police. And uh, if you remember back then, the SS took over the, the civil police force, and uh, there was always the, I want to see your papers, and so people got stopped a lot. And so the thing really that uh, I think is an issue that I want to hear from the legislatures, how many legislatures are here? Three here, one, two, three. Who's, who's the third one? I'm sorry. Senator, one, two, Representative. Right in front of you. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Senator. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if you guys remember, 163103. Anybody here in the police force? Do you remember what this is? Well, this is the um, stopping the suspect rule. Uh, this is uh, Colorado statutes. Peace officer may stop any person. What, what year is that? Uh, well, this is current. I'm, I actually don't, couldn't find out when it was passed. Um, and so maybe you can help us out there. Um, police officer may uh, stop any person who reasonably suspects is committing or has committed or is about to commit a crime. And it, it goes on a little bit. But um, that's basically the idea. This uh, law is uh, common in, I don't know, maybe half the states in the country. Um, and basically, uh, of course, who decides uh, what uh, reasonably suspect is? Well, the police officer gets to make that decision. And it's unpleasant when you've been on the receiving end of that, which I was one night when I was watching uh, at 1 o'clock in the morning a strange black car doing what to all appearances looked like dealing drugs to me. And I watched this car for about 15 minutes as it rolled down the street at about three miles an hour, about walking speed, turned around and came back. Um, and it was the strangest thing I'd ever seen. Uh, I've been in this neighborhood for 15 years. Turned out, uh, I found out after somebody turned the bright lights on in my face, it was a police officer. And I got the third degree for sitting in my car. Apparently sitting in your car is a suspicious activity when you're watching somebody who is doing something that's about as amazing as watching pigs fly. So, um, the legislature voted for this law. It, in my mind, turns Colorado into a police state because police officers now have the authority to, on the spot, make any kind of decision they want to about who they can stop to identify and God help you if you refuse or resist because then what happens? You're subject to arrest and we all know what can happen when things get heated in an arrest situation. So, would the legislature like to comment on Particular statute. Well, I'm, I'm, we're all looking at our deputy DA legislator first. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take the lead on that, I guess. Um, first of all, the statute that you cited, I think it's 163301, and, and um, that is yeah. And I think I think what you're you're citing is um, the codification of a constitutional um, standard <clears throat> called a Terry stop. Um, in Colorado, uh, reasonable suspicion stop, which has gone through um, decades of litigation um, since it was first really enunciated in the courts, the Supreme Court, probably about 30 or 40 years ago. And so, um, 
So really what that statute does is it codifies what was held by the United States Supreme Court to be something reasonable under the Fourth Amendment, a reasonable suspicion stop, a Terry stop. Uh, so I, I'm not really quite sure if, if, if you're wanting us to comment as to whether or not that's a good statute or it should be changed or something like that, but um, I just wanted to point out that it's something that's been in our jurisprudence for quite a while. Um, you did mention that it's and, and this is true, it's always open to, inter to interpretation, right? I mean, it's the reasonable suspicion, reasonable person standard. Yeah, and you if you have an unhappy police officer. One person's reasonableness may not be another person's reasonableness, and that's always the issue that the courts, uh, I think, struggle with all the time. When determining whether or not a stop was reasonable under the Terry Stop Standard or 163301. Um, so it is a source of uh, litigation when it when it, it actually turns into a, a criminal case and goes up to the appellate court and there's cases on it all the time, what's reasonable, what's not reasonable. And I know that um, police departments are advised of those all the time, particularly here in Boulder County. Uh, but as far as the statute goes, it's, it's something that's been in, in, uh, in the law here in the United States and in Colorado for quite some time. Well, so let's turn this around because uh, it then becomes uh, the police officers who turn that into something that uh, is very unpleasant for the community, um, or uh, or not, and uh, it's it seems inappropriate to me that the legislature uh, grants this degree of, of authority, um, and so ultimately I I blame them for you know making what looks to me like a police state, um, but I would hope that the police department then. Uh, exercises some restraint in what can otherwise be an abuse of power. And so, I don't know, I, I did go and talk to the police department about this uh, incident that I had, uh, and uh, there was no apology, no investigation, no, you know, as far as I understand, there is no uh, policy position uh, on the part of the Boulder Police Department that says uh, that we should or shouldn't find a certain degree of uh, reasonableness uh, when stopping somebody. And so, you know, it's a free-for-all. So, Ian, do you want to? I would just say that when the criminal defense attorney